So which begins now. So I briefly introduce ma'am. So Dr. Devi Jyoti Singh is a professor of English, Department of Liberal Art and Media Studies, J.C. Bose University of Science and Technology, Faridabad, Haryana. She is known for playing a pioneering role in introducing courses in literature, media, and social works in her university. She has contributed to incorporation of thr uh, thrilling electives like graphic novel writing, visual arts in the UG uh, PG programs of, of, uh, of faculty of uh, liberal art and media studies, J.C. Bose uh, University. And uh, her aim is to help her students visualize future technology in consonance with the social concerns. She has also contributed to numerous articles and research papers relating to issues of marginality, resistance, and alternative perspective in various reputed journals. So we welcome you, Deva, ma'am. <clears throat> Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Pooja. If you can just confirm whether my screen is visible to all. Yeah, yeah, it is very much visible, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pooja. And thank you, IFS, for giving me this opportunity. I'll uh, uh, start right away. Uh, the topic that I have chosen is uh, possibility of post-humanism. And I'll be connecting post-humanism uh, to the idea of Renaissance humanism and humanism as we find it manifest in our daily lives in the 21st century. I'll also see how uh, how post-humanism challenges, uh, you know, this humanism and how it sometimes reaffirms the same humanism that it seems to challenge, that it apparently challenges. So... Um, uh, these are the objectives outlined uh, in a in an academic manner, but I will try to approach the subject, blending a lot of creative work and uh, visual um, sort of exhibits that might just create interest or might sustain interest of all the audience here uh, in this very interesting critical theory and this very interesting critical approach that we have been talking uh, about for the past few years and uh, which will remain uh, very important for the coming years because in a way in a way it is charting the transition from the humanist phase to the post humanist phase if that transition is at all possible if that transition is possible so first we'll find out whether or we'll just try to, you know, sort of assess for ourselves how difficult would be this transition? What are the possibilities in this transition? And if it, if whatever we are saying, we are actually uh, positing truths that we ourselves believe in, that we ourselves think that uh, is something that we can participate in rather than just, you know, theoretically uh, posit. Okay, so is it just a theoretical proposition or is that is post-humanism something that we can apply to our lives that also we are going to consider. So as we begin, consider the talk of the town. Consider the talk of the town. We are speaking of Elon Musk, we are speaking of uh, Narendra Modi ji and we are of course speaking of what their missions are. So we see uh, Chandrayana 3 and Aditya L1 making news. We also see Musk's Neuralink, uh, you know, initiative where there will be implants in organic computer is what? Earlier, we used to compare the human brain with the CPU and say the CPU is like human brain. Today, we say our brains are like organic computers. So see the analogical shift. First, we are comparing machines to humans. Now we've come to the come to a new paradigm where we compare humans to machines. So you see the shift from uh, one paradigm to another, although it's just, it seems that the words have been swapped. It's actually a paradigm shift. Uh, look at some of the uh, news here uh, and, uh, you know, see, see how it translates into crisis of humanism. So first where we are and then where we began and then where we are headed to. So AI systems have learned how to deceive humans. What does that mean for our future? 
So they have learned to deceive humans. Geoffrey Hinton, uh, he has been saying that, uh, you know, they have become smarter and uh, there are very specific cases where uh, AI systems have of their own accord without uh, any sort of uh, prompt, they have taken on personalities, they have talk, taken on, uh, you know, identities and try to bluff uh, try to bluff, um, you know, uh, people who are playing with them. For example, there's this game Diplomacy and uh, one uh, one case where the humanoid or rather the rope, uh, the the system, AI system, it pretended to be a human with a girlfriend. Then was there was GPT-4 where it pretended to be a visually impaired human and convinced the worker, as you see here, to complete and complete a capture for it an eye robot uh, a sort of a you know uh, a dito eye robot in real life actually because isaac asimov was just writing about uh, these robots intelligent m machines but with intelligence comes not a set set of virtue perhaps but from humans uh, these machines have learned how to uh, deceive that's the important thing now on the other side of the spectrum is the other kind of news uh, so there is a uh, thaw accelerating, there's ecosystems, uh, new ecosystems coming up because of me melting glaciers, devastation. And uh, so you have UN reports where unpredicted, uh, you know, uh, sort of destruction on a massive scale is happening in on the planet. Now, all this, again, as I said, this translates into a crisis of humanism and crisis in humanism and perhaps that, uh, tells us why we are shifting to this post-humanism, this critical theory that we are talking about, this critical approach that we are th thinking about, and this uh, creative approach as well. So post-humanism, uh, what it does is actually it it first of all challenges anthropocentrism. I'm sure that in the first day of the uh, symposium, many of the uh, uh, experts would have spoken about it. However, I just want to, you know, sort because this is very important and it becomes a part of Renaissance humanism. I wanted to speak about it. So anthropocentrism is what it is. So we 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 knew that there were there was this theory of geocentrism. Earth is the center of the universe, given by Ptolemy, and then Copernicus came. Copernicus, Copernicus said that no, it's actually a heliocentric world that we are living in. The sun is the center. Similarly, there was a shift with Darwin, and we understood that now man is not the center uh, of this world anymore as we used to think. Of course, there was the idea of divinity, but we always and Till now, despite uh, the Dar Darwinian evolutionary theory, despite uh, understanding much about the space, despite understanding our the damage we are doing to the environment, we still persist in our anthropocentric and geocentric outlook, which is we still believe that man is the center of the universe and we still believe that Earth is somehow... Yeah, even that is being challenged because now we are more interested in other arts that we might want to inhabit because this one has lost its charm for us. So uh, there are complexities in the in any kind of narrative. Uh, and so there are in this one. Even our gods are anthropomorphic. So our androids and humanoids are also anthropomorphic. They are in the shape of humans. Now in this, um, in this particular uh you know in this uh, way of generalizing things rather than and in in this way of thinking of particulars and hypothesizing about particulars can we really overcome our habit of filtering everything through our human lens uh see uh coming back to the uh so for, for it, we have to just think about the history that has gone into this thought. And, uh, you know, the first uh, very important uh, time when we speak about it is Renaissance humanism. Of course, the Greeks were talking about, uh, you know, man's rationality and the challenge that gods posit to uh, man's power and man's reason. Because in Greek tragedies, what happens is that a human challenge is crushed by the gods, right? Now, but uh, but Renaissance humanism, there was again a reaffirmation of 
uh, the human centeredness and they were really inspired by the greek thought that try to move towards rationality uh, in humanism man is upheld as a repository of virtue and rationality and knowledge and so you th this kind of utopia keeps man at the center uh, even during renaissance humanism for example in shakespeare's uh, elizabethan plays you do find a sort of questioning towards this uh, centering of man as uh, most important being on earth so see for example hamlet's uh, soliloquy says what a piece of work is man how noble in reason how infinite in faculty in form and moving how express and admirable in action how like an angel in apprehension how like a god the beauty of the world the paragon of animals and yet to me what is this quintessence of dust man delights me not no nor woman either though by your your smiling you seem to say so so he's talking to rosencrantz and guildenstern and uh, so it's not a soliloquy perhaps it's then a monologue and uh, he is probably speaking in ironic terms or probably he's not ironic he really does believe that but he has become disenchanted with the idea of human he does believe it but the disenchantment has already set in so that may be because of his own life but when we come to 21st century this disenchantment is more pervasive it's not confined to some individual moment in your life or some individual episodes in some in a particular person's life it's more pervasive so uh coming to you know from renaissance which is 16th century this idea was uh, not again negated but humans remained central and they in fact the idea of human centrality reached its summit with the age of reason and the age of science which we call enlightenment so in 18th century and 19th century there was no decline in uh, the rational faculty of humans the power of humans in fact even when darwin came up with the idea of evolution we don't really think of evolution as open ended look at our science books we like to show that evolution ends with the humans humans at the summit so even if darwin was giving us an open ended text we still believe that it's closed evolution ends with humans and humans would remain at the summit of the whole evolutionary chain so enlightenment is again you know this starts with the 17th century thought and it reaches its peak in 19th century science is the backbone of it all this is creating a lot of megalomania in humans uh uh, uh this in fact is our articulated in a statement which talks about our being and which has been taken as the most uh, let's say representative statement of human uh, knowledge human knowledge as we see today even in postmodern and modern times so cognito ergo sum i think therefore i am it's not i i love therefore i am i i think uh, or i sort of uh, i feel therefore i am it's i or i move therefore i am no it's i think therefore i am and it's very important statement that we have even when we sort of even today when we patronize stem and neglect humanities uh, we somehow believe that humanities has nothing to do with reason rationality it's science that we need to invest in it's science that is the future of humans and this particular statement is um, something that we have stood by and uh, upheld all through this time now uh, here i would like to uh, draw your attention to the works of and the uh, propositions of uh, of course critical propositions of uh, of researchers like rosy bredotti he in post human knowledge he writes about you know the generalization and exclusion implicit in enlightenment era so when they spoke about the rational man the rational man was usually the white again western male we have been criticizing the poor white western male for a lot of time now but it seems that 
uh, very little introspection has gone, uh, you know, towards us ourselves. And even, you know, the wi white Western male is not any close to introspecting himself. The, we have been, you know, following the same things we, uh, despite of a better knowledge. And this is, uh, you know, how I sort of infer the situation. Uh, uh, Bredotti, he says that uh, post-humanism, he finds it a very useful tool. He says it's a generative tool to help us rethink the basic unit of reference for the human in the historical uh, moment when the human has become a geological force capable of affecting all life on this plan planet. But then we revise this role. See, all animals evolve, but only humans know that we evolve. This is what we assume. At the same time, we also do not just let ourselves evolve, but we are intruding upon uh, intruding upon evolutionary process. We try to create new species. We try to give birth to hybrids. We are even, you know, ignoring the ethical concerns. And now today we are, have gone beyond, again, uh, organic experiments. We are also moving into the paradigm of cyborgs. Donna Haraway has not just spoken about the informatics and how uh, power is exuded through statistics and collecting data and all that. But you can see an example of Elon Musk, how, uh, you know, uh, future, in future, we may see many more cyborgs around us. Cyborgs would be humans with enhanced capabilities because they have some chips fitted in, uh, which give them almost superhuman capabilities uh, as they have machine and AI components installed in them. Uh, now, this kind of future, uh, you know, there are some possibilities that we can think of, but much more happens actually on the ground than we can envisage. So the, we, we talked about, again, uh, so we, we need to really talk about genetic engineering for a bit and eugenics. It came up with uh, social Darwinism and post-Darwinism as, uh, as a pseudoscience within uh, genetics. Uh, and uh, it was called science of human genetics. Uh, and we know that Second World War, in Second World War, lots of eugenics experiments took place. And post-Second World War, many... Governments, including our own Indian government, it uh, put in this policy in some way or the other because you know that uh, many people were sterilized uh, in a drive uh, which was undertaken by the government at that time. Now, these sterilization drives are not uh, drives that are, uh, you know, uh, of a pan kind of origin where everybody would be covered. No, they, they are targeted towards selective groups. And so if the white male is in the procreative role, not even the white woman, the white man, because you see all the anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic images, it's the white, uh, you know, divinity is white male God. Zeus is white male, even the Christian God that Raphael and, uh, you know, the great important uh, uh, Renaissance painters draw, these are all uh, white gods, white and blue eyed. So this would be the eugenics crusade. We do not know what is in what future holds for us. But as the planet is fast moving towards dictatorship and uh, cross capitalism, you really don't know. Post humanism and what it does, as we said, Rosie Brad, uh, Bradiotti, he has a lot of, he thinks it has promise. So it also offers some kind of utopia and hypothesis, rhetoric philosophy, fiction, criticism. And in this, we replace the Da Vinci's uh, Vitruvian man completely in post-humanism. We have a man marked as superfluous and absent. You see these two figures, but you also know that somehow some remnant, some residue of humanity is there. You, you can't really visualize a world, or can you, where humans are absent? We'll just try to talk about it quickly. Uh, I will try to see the messages that are in the chat, but uh, what does it say? Uh, please, res okay, okay. Uh, yes, yes, I read it. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yes, it may happen, but uh, Pratibha, uh, probably what the gender 
I do respect that, but probably the gender won't matter here. The um, uh, what would matter here is what is what this particular person, the idea that this particular person was putting forth. Okay, uh, so so I would try to you know keep it in mind as you have told me. Okay, uh, so I do not at all take it away from her or from her gender, but maybe what this person is saying is something which is uh, which is something which is for humanity, which is for our combined future. Okay, you are kindly uh, on mute while the session goes on to avoid this. Okay, just let me read this. Okay, so uh, I hope you understand that it's not a matter of respect. Okay. So consider the possibility of post-humanism, but does post-humanism undercut its very own premise? That's what we want to ask. Can there be really post-humanism worldview or perspective or being next? How would this sense of being be and how could we attain it? And how could this be articulated? Now, all these are very abstract questions. And I would like to, you know, you know, sort of introduce you to an activity which would make us understand the difficulties involved in this. So can there be a perspective without a human subject? I'm just asking this. Look at this picture. Can there be a perspective without a human subject? And what post-humanism is doing is it's, it's just challenging subjectivity, human subjectivity of all kind. Uh, the Western myth of narcissism, where, again, the subject and the object is the same, or the Eastern myth, uh, where narcissus uh, is sad because there will be no human to watch it bloom, okay? So, so they're both the sides, you have a problem. And here, here is an activity that I would like all of you to participate in for a while. If you have a one rupee coin, kindly take it out. And if you have a one rupee coin, I kindly take it out and I would, you know, really appreciate if you could just for, for one minute, give uh, some chance to this activity. So you imagine that you are an alien and if you imagine you are an alien and you come across uh, this kind of a thing, uh, this kind of an object and you just have to, you know, sort of think of two lines of your response just think of it as an alien. Okay, so and there is no limit to this activity. For example, I will not set a boundary to this activity. What kind of alien you are, what kind of language you speak on, speak in, how developed it is, your language, your speech, your intelligence, no. And uh, whether you'll fear it or you'll... So that sort of a thing uh, I would try to avoid. Am I taking the audience along? I would just want uh, an affirmation from the audience here. Yeah, if, yes, if, ma'am. Yeah, Mitali, thank you. Uh, Mitali, uh, I would really appreciate if a few of us could just, you know, sort of uh, put their mind to it. Uh, uh, is anyone even thinking of it, you know? Because this is an important uh, activity. Uh, and this will help you see how how it is very difficult for humans while they speak of post-humanism, while they posit such theories to really come out of this, again, the box that we are in, the box that we uh, tend to think in. And then who will be thinking if we will not be thinking? For example, uh, the dogs aren't deliberating here right now. The apes are not listening to me. The birds are busy somewhere else. And while saying this, I'm not demeaning any form of life, but I'm saying that all these are concerns and problems that we have created and all these concerns and problems are something that, first of all, we'll have to truthfully address. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. Will someone want to, you know, just sort of, uh, I'm not able to, uh, you know, sort of roll this screen. We, so ha sorry. we have two, two responses from our audience. Oh, great. Let me yes. see. Yes. Yes, you're right. Somebody's saying, actually, ma'am, you know about the point. That's so... Uh, 
uh, that's so right. This is the whole thing. I probably try to tap on it or press on it, send the signal exactly. So, and actually, you mean uh, you know about the coin to think like an alien? Exactly the exactly my point. Uh, you know, you will tap to tap and do all that stuff. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, that you will be doing it, and you will be thinking whether you know, for example, your. Uh, Mamta uh, ma'am and um, you know she's she logged in from Ashita's uh, uh, screen so she said that probably she'd try to eat it you know whether it's something edible now uh, this is what happens you know here too we understand our need to eat here too we, we it is difficult for us to imagine ourselves as aliens uh, we tap it and do all these uh, very human uh, things that we do. We are not even able to imagine an alien who will not be whole, able to grasp it, probably, who will be something like in something flimsy like air or maybe a protean form of life. So we are, again, habituated to anthropomorphism of some sort. Our aliens are in our own image, just as our gods are in our own image, mostly, mostly. So thank you, Anupama. Uh, thank you, Chitraji. Uh, and um, uh, I would check the surface. Uh, yes, Ashita. And uh, well, thank you. This is uh, good. I'm thank you. Uh, I thank you for your responses here. Uh, coming to this again, uh, a text where human is absent, where human is neither washed nor. Ma'am, you're not audible. Um, uh, Ma'am, you're not audible. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I was not yes, audible for how many minutes? Past how many minutes? I'm no, sorry. Some seconds, ma'am. Just some seconds. Okay, some seconds. Now I'm yeah. audible. Okay, yeah, ma yeah, ma'am. So, 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 it's just that, you know, uh, post-humanist thought, post-humanist text, it's really difficult to uh, uh, think of these to be think of such a being, such a such an articulate statement. How would posthumanism be possible? This is uh, the point. Is it even possible? See, uh, what if uh, they inscribe in formats unknown to man? Even that, and the point uh, proves our epistemological assumptions that you know words somehow suggest uh, knowledge and understanding. Words are the way to articulate what we have around. Probably dogs don't have the same words as humans, but probably they have an understanding. Probably they also articulate. I mean, I'm just po positing a few possibilities, just taking one of the species as uh, one of the species as, uh, you know, uh, the center. So, uh, so when we think of can there be a post-humanist text, again, there, there have been uh, discussions and one such discussion I'm missing who uh, actually the theorist is. Allow me. So one such discussion is uh, the infinite monkey theorem. It states that a monkey hitting keys at random on a typewriter keyboard for an infinite amount of time. This, was, uh, this monkey and all these monkeys together, they will be able to produce or reproduce all the works of Shakespeare. Okay. All the works of Shakespeare. Now, this is a, just a sort of probability issue. They will, but how much time will they take? How much time will they take? And here's a visual to sort of endorse or support this theorem. It's, it's a sort of interesting take, and therefore I thought that I should share it with you. Text by non-humans, another possibility is, again, you know, the monkeys. But again, how important is Shakespeare for the monkeys? How important, again, because Shakespeare was essentially wanted to communicate about the milk of human kindness. And what about the apes? What will they be interested in? Shakespeare? Now, second is text by non-humans. Again, up another possibility. Yes, another possible answer is that 
you know, AI text generators are very much there today. Um, and everybody is again talking about chat GPT, these raw, uh, artificial intelligence uh, writing about it and all that. The, the, the debate between, uh, again, uh, Ro Roland Barthes and Michel Foucault, this seems redundant because, uh, you know, it's about whether the uh, author is dead. But and there, even there, there are glimmers of author as a person. Michel Foucault is is like uh, at pains to prove that we can't really write off the author. But here in AI text, there is, uh, you know, text generated without the use of the author. So, so what? And uh, you know that uh, these uh, these AI robots are writing apocalyptic texts more than anything else. They don't have a sweet vision of the future because most of the data sets that they have collected, the massive data that is there, uh, points towards some kind of grim reality. Um, and this takes us back to the Frankenstein complex. So Mary Shelley, as you know, she uh, wrote uh, this, it's hailed as a gothic novel, and it sort of uh, takes us back to our primal fears, you know, if we create something, can our creation be better than us? Can our creation even backfire and destroy us? So humans effectively, they dehumanize other humans and ably, uh, you know, demonize their own creations. This we do. For example, uh, you know, Kafka was a Czech German Jew. He was writing uh, the metamorphosis when he was doing that, uh, when he was writing um, uh, metamorphosis. Uh, Nazism was on rise in Eastern Europe and in Central Europe. And uh, this Nazism was on rise and Czechs were at the receiving ends of it. So the dehumanization that he felt at the uh, hands of the Nazis is articulated in this text because he felt like a dung beetle and this particular story uh, tells you about life from a perspective from a dung beetle or a worm. So it gives you a worm's eye view of the situation, not a panoramic view, not from a vantage point, not an aerial view, but a worm's eye view. We come to a very different take from Asimov and Asimov envisaged uh, robots 50 years before the Japanese assembly lines, uh, you know, were manned by robots actually. And when we talk about Isaac Asimov, uh, he is very famous for articulating the three laws. Later on, the a fourth, a zeroth law of robotics also came. The robot may not injure a human being through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Here, the robot is subservient to human, just as Carol Capek had envisaged it, because uh, this is a Czech word, uh, comes from Czech word robota, which means a serf or a slave. Serf and slaves are slightly, again, different because of the context, land rights, etc. So a robot must obey orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with human's life. Next, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and the second law. In all this, humans have tried to drill into the algorithm of uh, these intelligent machines that uh, they do not have to compromise on human life. Now, if if the robot is meant for dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks, the three Ds, then it is all right. But if the robot is also required in decision-making process, and then you say that the robot has not to is to compromise its own life and save human life, then there is a narrative, a story of conflict that emerges from such a situation. And that is what Isaac Asimov tells us. And he tells us uh, that we are still dealing, that we were still, when back when he was writing, we were still dealing with, uh, you know, our own superiority and Frankenstein complex, which we are to get rid of even now. Our multiverse, our metaverse, metaverse would be all the noosphere, the virtual reality, the internet, all connected together. But it will be in the virtual world, metaverse. And multiverse is the parallel universes that we sort of talk about nowadays. So our planetary imperialism 
two is uh, it surprises us no more and we want to dominate, colonize a uh, new world. So as we are not living in post-colonial world, we are still thinking of colonization. So since post, post and post-colonialism is debatable, similarly post and post-humanism is debatable for us. Um, so why are we talking about this when we think that we still are the center? Are we trying to pass on the buck to from natural intelligence, our own intelligence to extraterrestrials and artificial uh, intelligence? And where does the resolution lie? One re possible resolution a is in uh, the suggestions made by the indigenous communities of uh, America, indigenous peoples of America who are known for their environmental stewardship. They talk about not land belonging to people, not possession like we do here or like the Western European powers do, but about coexistence and people belonging, people and other creatures belonging to the land rather than to the planet rather than the other way around so you see it's not about ownership or possession it's about belongingness and coexistence so if we can follow that sort of a living thinking and uh, knowing then probably there is a better future for us similarly you know we were talking about um, our propensity to filter everything even when we take pictures that are animal that belong to the animal domain or kingdom, we still, uh, you know, think of a human purpose. Can we circumvent the, that? Yes, as I said, there are some possibilities. Uh, the possibilities take us in different directions. They pull us in different directions. And uh, one would be, uh, you know, uh, going back to the sustainable roots and going back to coexistence. And now right now we are still emulating machines, our dances, our music is all uh, inspired by machines. Right now we still suffer from our own megalomania, even in times of prehistory, when humans were not there, when humans were not recording, were, when humans did not even exist, even there we like to go back, we like to tell our own tales, we like to intrude, we like to probably even replicate those walls and be there inside, though we were not there, though we were not supposed to be there. For example, look at the case of uh, the documentary When Dinosaurs Roamed America, uh, most probably it's by Discovery, and the commercial film Jurassic Park based on a novel of the same name. We even try to intrude in pre-humanist living. So how much is it possible for us to go back uh, to, you know, go to a post-humanist future? So to be or not to be the same question that Hamlet would have been raising, uh, it, our confidence has been undermined to an extent because we see we have undergone cosmological trauma with Copernicus telling us you are not the cent your earth and you are not the center of universe biological trauma Darwin telling us we are not the head psychological trauma Freud telling us that our, even our bodies and minds are not centered within properly so despite that we uh, still persist but if we break through all of our assumptions like we were required to do in that coin activity, then there is liberation for us. If we are ready to follow the living or the lifestyle that is uh, not informed by our own greed, uh, which is altruistic, which is of coexistence, which is of belongingness to the planet, then and rather than be sky bound, if we are like earth bound, as Ehab uh, Hassan would say, if we are not sky haunted, rather we are earth bound, then there's a great possibility for post humanism. I would urge everybody to embrace the earth bound post humanism, which actually has a, a blueprint of hope for the planet. Uh, thank you very much and um, regret it if there was anything that that uh, was not palatable or uh, you know not in the right context uh, my only 
attempt was here and I'm still dabbling in post-humanism. Uh, there are different things that I want to do. I'm not very much into any one particular theory. I like to explore like the rest. So kindly forgive me if there were cert certain flaws in the in the in the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. And back to Pooja and back to IFIS. Uh, again, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me, uh, you know, this much time and uh, for uh, placing their trust in me uh, for this particular topic. Thank you very much. Well, we are open for the questions, if any. Uh, let me check. Uh, Ma'am, there is one question. Am I audible? Yes, Pooja, ma'am. Yes, you are very much audible. We are audible. Diva, ma'am. I think she has to be here, no? Hello, Divya, ma'am. Are you there? Maybe, uh, maybe it is pause. Let you are see. continuously speaking, no? I'm so, not able to post. Okay. So, uh, let me speak, ma'am, then. Uh, there is one question. There are strange patterns on this small uh, plate of metal. Is this how the earthlings used to communicate with each other using these sign, uh, using these two sign, uh, sign tools? Uh, I think, ma'am. Okay, uh, now I'm able to unmute myself. I'm sorry, I was not able to unmute uh... That's okay, ma'am. Okay, so uh, uh, what what is it? Uh, just just give me a session. What were you saying, Pooja? Which particular yeah, 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 picture are we talking there about? There's a theory, ma'am. Let me see. Uh, there are strange patterns on this small plate of metal. Is this how the Earthlings used to communicate with each other using these uh to sign tools? Earthlings. Yeah. Well, it's very difficult to think about earthlings when I myself am an earthling. I have to first dissociate and completely alienate myself from them. I am not sure I understand. Probably you are talking about this. Are you? Uh, this particular picture? This, this particular image, is it? This image? So these are uh, more or less electronic circuits, maybe a motherboard and, uh, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, electronic again uh, circuits that you see it's just an image uh, and earthlings could yes communicate uh, via certain um, uh, various communication channels have opened up you know that we have been sending cosmonauts and astronauts to the world outside and they have been able to communicate to us so uh, in future again you know even not just that but all the vehicles and payloads and spaceships all these are also able to communicate to us. Don't know about aliens and earthlings talking to each other, but probably there will be channels soon if because, uh, you know, uh, possibilities are always there. But if, if I could know, Pooja, to which particular picture is being referred to here, I would be... Am I there? Yeah. Which particular picture? Can you please... Uh, I yeah. think, ma'am, it was a response to the co uh, coin activity. Oh, the coin activity. Okay. Okay, so somebody, yeah. So, um, thank you. That's a, that's a clever, <clears throat> clever, clever, clever response to it, I would say. Yes, you, you would, you sort of think of yourself as an alien and you think of earthlings and you're thinking whether they would be able to communicate through this coin uh, or is this, this coin a communication device? A very interesting take, I would say. Good, great. Yes, so Any yes, you can try it with your own students in the class. Believe me, this activity is fabulous for, you know, again, making your students think outside the given paradigms. And there are many responses, ma'am. They have enjoyed your Hamlet references. As Thank well. you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, very informative and uh, and, and Somyajit and yeah. uh, Barnini. Thank you so much. The responses oh, are pouring in. It was Barnini who made the comment. Uh, yes, great. Uh, uh, it was uh, an interesting take. Thank yeah. you, Susante. Any other questions you, you have? 
Okay, Shalini, that was a response to uh, yes. So Pooja, I've gone through uh, most of the uh, most okay, of the fine. Man. So let me. Thank you so much, Divij, Dr. Divijyoti, ma'am, for giving us your, um, a great learning on many points relating to Renissa, for making us think like an alien, monkey theorem, and then throwing light on passing the buck. Please accept our thanks for a great presentation, ma'am. And looking forward to hearing you speak again. We appreciate for much. giving us your valuable time, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank very you, much to the audience for listening to me patiently. Thanks. Thanks so Thank much. you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you.